Choosing the right motherboard for your gaming PC build can be one of the more confusing parts to get right. There are very few other components where you have so much choice, such a wide discrepancy of features and such an enormous variance in pricing. And that begs the question, how should you go about choosing a motherboard for your next build? How much money do you need to spend? And what features really matter for your next system? Well, in today's video, I'll be explaining just that by covering everything you need to know about buying a motherboard in 2020. I'm walking through some of my favorite motherboard options on the market right now so you guys can get some specific product recommendations too. Corsair Custom Labs is here and supports a wide range of products and components, now including PC memory. Simply choose your desired Vengeance RGB configuration of speed and capacity and pick from one of the amazing custom designs. Whether you're into sci-fi or this amazing variation of Cherry Blossom, there's a myriad of options to pick from. You can match your peripherals with the same custom Labs Design 2 for a fully unified gaming setup and even configure multiple product designs at once with live renders. Learn more about Corsair Custom Labs and check it out for yourself at the first link in the description below. Now let's start off with the fundamentals. The motherboards available to you will depend entirely on the CPU choice in your gaming PC build. And it's this which is going to help you narrow things down from the beginning. So let's start there. Different motherboards have different sockets for different CPUs and there are currently two main sockets on offer for AMD and Intel. For AMD, you're looking at the AM5 socket, which supports the current generation Ryzen 9000 and last generation Ryzen 7000 processors, while Intel are currently using their LGA 1851 socket for their core ultra CPU lineup. AMD are known for extending socket lifespans more than Intel, which I personally think is a great pro-consumer choice that reduces upgrade costs, while Intel typically renew the same socket for a maximum of two generations. There are some exceptions to this, 12th, 13th and 14th gen from Intel all use the same socket, but it looks like Core Ultra 200 series might be going the other way with only one lineup to use the current LGA 1851 design, which if true, is a shame. Once you've determined the socket your CPU choice requires, requires, the next thing to discuss is chipsets. Now the chipset is arguably the most important thing to look for when buying a motherboard, as it actually tells you a huge amount about the board that you're purchasing. Now a chipset is a small controller chip on the motherboard itself, usually located in the bottom right, that manages communication between the CPU, GPU, memory and storage. Now the CPU typically connects with its bandwidth directly to high speed items like the primary GPU slot, your RAM and normally the top NVMe slot. While well, the chipset connects basically everything else. It's essentially the little bit of magic that allows your board to have extra PCI slots, extra high-speed USB ports, faster networking, better Wi-Fi, you get the gist. Now the way this all works revolves around a thing called PCIe lanes. Your CPU has a set number of PCIe lanes. In the case of a standard Ryzen 9000 series CPU, for example, you get 28 in total, 16 for the GPU, hence it's called the PCI X16 slot, two sets of four for NVMe drives, hence these are labeled X4 and a further four for the chipset connection. The chipset then provides the extra lanes of bandwidth needed to enable any extra connectivity. The higher end the chipset, the more lanes that are available, and as such, the more connectivity the motherboard manufacturer can provide on its design. Okay then, so the higher the better. Technically, yes, but it all depends on what you actually need. The standard PCI lanes provided by the CPU are typically more than enough to power up a PCI Gen 5 graphics card and a single Gen 5 NVMe simultaneously. And as such, if you're building a fairly standard gaming PC, even one that's moderately high end, you're probably gonna be completely fine. The extra lanes on higher end boards are great for those who need specifically extra connectivity, faster networking, more expansion for SSDs, and additional PCI slots for things like network or storage cards. You'll also find that boards with higher end chipsets also tend to beef up things like power delivery and cooling, which is the next really important thing to discuss. Now, in many respects, the motherboard is the backbone of your PC build. Not only does it connect pretty much all of your components together, but it also provides power for lots of them, including the CPU, your NVMe drives, and actually the first 75 watts of GPU power too. That's something a lot of people just don't realize. The GPU power cable is all for extra juice. And power delivery is a really important thing to note when looking at a motherboard. Looking at CPU power delivery, and if you take the MSI Pro B840M-B, for example, one of the cheapest B840 boards on the market, you get just 10 phase VRM power delivery and very little visible cooling for these power phases. Compare this to the X870E Carbon Wi-Fi, another board 
from MSI, but a higher end design, and you get a 21 phase VRM power delivery. Now in theory, both of these boards will support the same CPU socket, and as such, you could technically install exactly the same CPUs in both. But if you chucked in AMD's current top end 9950X3D, the system would boot, but the fewer power phases and weaker power delivery would likely lead to the VRMs overheating and potentially a restriction on your boost clock speeds too. Now that doesn't make the MSI Pro B840M in this particular example a bad motherboard, it just doesn't make it proportional for AMD's top end 9950X3D. Additional VRM power delivery that you'll find on some boards and additional VRM cooling can allow for a greater degree of overclocking headroom too, bolstering support for those high-end CPUs. Now historically overclocking support was restricted only to the top end motherboards for this reason. And while AMD have opened things up a bit more in this regard, Intel is still fairly closed when it comes to CPU overclocking. RAM overclocking is a must, but CPU overclocking is something that is becoming increasingly less popular. So that's chipsets then, but what about features? Now for me, there's some really simple ones straight off the bat. You should absolutely go with a board that has Wi-Fi natively built in. It's no secret that third party aftermarket Wi-Fi dongles just aren't that good. And it's for that reason that over on Geek PC, which is our UK pre-building company, we only offer boards with Wi-Fi as standard. And let's face it, for the cost of a non-Wi-Fi motherboard and a Wi-Fi dongle, you might as well get it all in one package. You also want to make sure your motherboard has at least four RAM DIMMs. That's unless, of course, you've got a smaller mini ITX design where the space restriction doesn't allow that to actually fit. I would also recommend going with an IO that consists of at least a couple of USB-C ports, as that's the way things are going. The other big feature you should be looking for is PCI Generation 5 support. The direction we're heading in with GPUs is only going to see this become more and more the standard. And I think if you're looking to protect upgrade paths on your gaming PC, it's absolutely something you should regard as a must have. The same goes for NVMe SSDs, and the inclusion of at least one PCI Gen 5 NVMe slot is pretty crucial in my opinion. We have to be careful when talking about future-proofing because it's sort of impossible to truly future-proof anything, but this is a surefire way to keep options a little more open. Other features to look out for are some form of boot-up debugging. Now this will typically come in two different forms. The first is a sophisticated Q-code display that shows any error codes encountered during boot, which is highly specific and very useful. The other is a more simple LED system that will illuminate through four stages, CPU, RAM, VGA, and boot during the boot-up process. Now these can be immensely useful if your PC just won't turn on or output to a display, and it allows you to isolate the specific component that may be causing the problem. Some of the boards will also feature a reverse connector design. This is where all the ports for cables are moved to the rear of the board, something which aims to aid cable management and make the build look nicer from the front. For MSI, this is branded as Project Zero. For Asus, it's called BTF. And for Gigabyte, they regard this as their Project Stealth series. Now, these boards can be cool and are becoming more popular. You'll just, of course, need to note that the case you've gone for is compatible and features the appropriate cutouts to allow you to leverage reverse connect motherboard designs. The other thing to consider upon purchasing a motherboard is the size. Now, generally speaking, there are four standard sizes of motherboards. These range from the very smallest mini ITX form factor to the slightly larger micro ATX form factor, standard ATX form factor, and of course, your extended or E-ATX form factor motherboards. Now, generally speaking, the mini ITX motherboard market is reserved for those building smaller form factor systems. And in truth, there's little reason to buy a mini ITX motherboard unless it's one of the key aims of your build for the system to be small. Now, the micro ATX board segment is typically utilized by those looking to build a standard system and trim out cost. Due to their more compact size versus ATX, they tend to feature less features. Their expansion tends to be a little more restricted and connectivity can drop down to reduce cost. Unlike the mini ITX form factor though, it isn't so small that it becomes a manufacturing challenge to fit the key functionality on, explaining why micro ATX boards are nine times out of 10 cheaper than their mini ITX counterparts. The ATX board form factor is the most popular and it's what you'll find most people use in their gaming PC builds. They give plenty of real estate for connectivity and features and often do 
do so at the widest range of price points. Larger extended ATX motherboards are typically used in instances where a manufacturer wants to maximize the connectivity and features on their board, such as in the case of the MSI Godlike series, which puts features above all else and of course needs the extra space to actually make this happen. Now the size of your motherboard will also define what case choices are available to you, but it's also common to decide on the case first and motherboard second. Either way, the two have to fit together. Smaller cases will only support your smaller motherboard sizes, while some larger cases will also emit support for the tiny mini ITX motherboard form factor too. So with those features in mind, and before I actually finally run through some of my favorite options right now, it's time to address the big question. How much should you actually spend on a motherboard in 2025? Now I don't want to be that guy, but this question all depends on what you're trying to achieve. Now I am going to give you some prices, so let's give that a go. If you want to build an awesome mid-range gaming PC, you should be trying to keep your motherboard costs to in and around $200 or £200. Less than this is going to free up budget for other components like the GPU. Now of course if you really want a certain number of high-speed USB 4 ports, you want Wi-Fi 7, you may have to spend a little more. And equally you might be after a particular brand or even particular model of motherboard that fits the design and aesthetic of your build better. And while that will cost you more money, in my opinion that's totally valid. For higher end gaming PC builds using top end motherboard chipsets, you're going to have to revise your budget up and work through into the $300 or £300 territory. This will start to unlock better features like better overclocking, more widespread PCI Gen 5 support and give you quality of life additions like quick release GPU slots and easy toolless NVMe installation for all of the connectors on the board. It will also unlock things like those Q-code displays I mentioned earlier. If you're building a smaller form factor system and you need to pick up a more compact design like this from MSI or this board from Asus, you're going to pay a premium. And equally, if you're assembling a PC for video editing or content creation, you may find yourself gravitating towards more expensive designs like the Asus ProArt range, which typically offer creator-centric features like a large number of fast USBs and super fast networking. But of course, it's going to come at a cost. Now then, what are my favorite boards? We've talked about everything, what am I loving right now and why? And let's start off with Gigabyte's B850 Eagle Wi-Fi 6E. Now the reason I love this motherboard so much is because of the price and the features. It's reliably one of the best value B850 boards and is an awesome pick for the likes of a Ryzen 5 CPU. It gives you the DDR5 RAM NIMS of which there's four, the AM5 socket, VRM cooling is more restricted but definitely sufficient and you get plenty of PCI slots too. The top NVMe slot is toolless which I like. If I look at the rear IO you can also see the connectivity is solid. It's a a little bit more basic than higher end options out there, but it still gives you the fast USB-A and USB Type-C, and of course you get Wi-Fi built in. If you want to save even more money still, you might also want to consider this, the ASRock B850M Pro RS Wi-Fi. Now compared to the Gigabyte Eagle board, you do lose some connectivity and some features, but again the fundamentals are the same. You still get the AM5 socket, you still get four RAM DIMM slots, and integrated Wi-Fi. The only thing that's different really is the build quality, the VR RMs and the cooling. You can even just see here by the state of this heatsink at the top, it's really not doing very much. The Gigabyte board feels more substantial and a better quality design. If you take a look at the rear I.O. here, we do lose some quality of life features. The Wi-Fi antennas are now screwed in rather than a nice toolless design and you get less USB ports on here of a slightly slower speed variety as well. You do keep features though like BIOS flashback which allows you to easily update the motherboard BIOS without the installation of a CPU and the smaller micro ATX form factor can be good for really kind of value oriented gaming PCs. Compared to the Gigabyte board though you get a lot less by way of PCI expansion which does limit your options for the future. Now my next two boards are going to cost you a little more money. Now this Gigabyte design let's start with that first. This is the X870 Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7 ICE. Now what I love about this board is it's one of the most kind of aesthetically pleasing motherboards out there. You get loads of quality of life features like toolless NVMe including for your second tranche of slots and we actually have two Gen 5 slots here as well as a Gen 5 slot at the top which is really Really rather nice. Everything from the RAM DIMMs to that Q code display I mentioned earlier are color coded. And if we take a look at the rear IO at the back, you'll see we gain things like an optical audio port. We've got the same two and a half gig Ethernet seen on other boards. The Wi Fi is going to notch up to Wi Fi 7 from Wi Fi 6E. Also, like Gigabyte's little release button for easily loosening off the graphics card. If you want more overclocking headroom and a higher end design overall, this absolute monster ASRock Tai Chi is a really great shout. It's going to cost you less than some of the high end boards from the likes of MSI. But 
still gives you top end features like the shielding at the back of the board to protect the PCB. We get again tallest NVMe for our top slot, but the lower ones are manual. VRM power delivery is very, very strong. So you're going to get good overclocking support. And the IO on here is really absolutely fantastic. Five gigabit ethernet, optical audio, USB 4, top and bottom. We've got Wi-Fi 7, slightly more sophisticated, clear CMOS and BIOS flashback functionality. It's just going to give you quite a bit more by way of actual features. If you're looking for a board with creative use cases in mind, then the ProArt X870 Creator Wi-Fi is the reasonable choice. It does things like give you two PCI slots, but spaces them out in a way that makes sense for a dual GPU setup or for two expansion cards. Dual GPUs only really make sense now for content creation. Gaming, there's not really a use anymore. You get the standard AM5 socket, four RAM DIMMs, tallest NVMe. The big party trick with this though is gonna be that IO. I mean, look at it. You've got loads and loads of 10 gig USBs. You've got 40 gig USB-Cs, 20 gig USB-Cs. The only thing I would love to see Asus add is an optical audio port. They've actually got shielding on the other three to maintain the integrity and 10 gigabit ethernet alongside a secondary two and a half gig. The ProArt is a really great choice for that. If you really need the ultimate in connectivity, I do want to shout out the Godlight because it's a work of art. It's just going to cost you a hell of a lot of money. You can see there's just an immense amount of coverage here for heat sinks. You've got a screen here on the side. The IO is absolutely nuts. We get a 10 gig ethernet, a five gig ethernet. You get Wi-Fi 7, loads of super high speed USB-Cs all down the side. And that full shielding we talked about where we saw the partial shielding on, of course, the ASRock design. The final two boards to talk about are those of you looking for mini ITX recommendations. I've got two to show you here today. One is white and one is black. The B850i Edge Ti Wi-Fi from MSI and the more expensive X870i Gaming from Asus. This is also a good way to kind of compare the two chipsets. And what you can see straight away is that the Asus board, despite them being the same physical form factor, just feels chunkier. It's got a higher buildup on terms of the cooling and the heat sinks. You've got a bigger array here for stacked M.2 drives. A lot of these boards on the rear will have M.2 slots too. I actually think the Asus one doesn't, but our MSI board design does. And you can see again the difference here in IO. If I just, it's quite, quite tricky to hold these. If I show you the IOs on these two boards, you can clearly tell which is the X870 and which is the B850. Now you might be thinking, James, you've not mentioned any Intel motherboards. Now in truth, a lot of these brands make both and have got really good at providing unified names. So we have a ProArt board for Intel. We have a Godlike for Intel. We have a Strix ITX form factor board for Intel. The other reason though, I'm not spending too much time talking about Intel. No one's really buying Intel motherboards right now. And as such, it doesn't make sense. On that note, I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned a bit about motherboards. I hope I've helped you find the next motherboard for your build because I think it might be the most confusing component. If you want to see more PC building content from me, make sure to get subscribed. I'll link all my favorite boards down below for Amazon and Newegg for latest pricing in your region. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.